This is a lecture on Norbert Zongo's novel, The Parachute Drop. It's the second of two lectures on Norbert Zongo. The first lecture was on Norbert Zongo's journalism and tired the Mombotuization of Burkina Faso. Now, uh, Zongo was a journalist who lived in Burkina Faso, a very gifted journalist, but he also wrote novels. And uh, this novel, The Parachute Drop, has been translated into English. Uh, Zongo was a, a journalist, however, and a novelist who was very concerned with politics. He was a, he was a political man, and, uh, and his novels deal with very serious political themes. And um, he was, uh, was killed for his writing. He was killed by Blaise Compore for his journalism. And uh, he was uh, tortured for writing this novel when he was uh, living in, uh, in Togo, where he wrote it. So it's, it's an interesting novel, and uh, it is, uh, the, the title takes, it, it, it is from a, uh, an incident in the novel that occurs when two uh, figures in the military of a fictional nation named Watanbo are... Um, are uh, their, their their parachutes are rigged and they're and they're killed and this is what uh, leads to the beginning of the coup d'état against the fictional fictional president of this country named Watanbo whose name is Guama and he's a pretty uh, disgusting figure. Uh, it's an interesting novel because the the main character is is so unlikable and. Some readers respond to this by they, they're they're riveted by the novel, riveted by the reading, and yet it's uh, also often I've heard the comment he's Guama is just such a disgusting figure. But uh, what's what's interesting about this novel is that it gives us a glimpse into the psychology of an African dictator. And although uh, Zongo was murdered by uh, Blaise Compore and his brother Francois Compore. And he was tortured when he was a student in Togo and wrote this novel, or, or at the time he was living in Togo, that is. Um, he was uh, not just talking about the situation in Togo. He was not just talking about the situation in Burkina Faso. He was not just talking about the situation in Zaire under Mombotu. He was talking about a phenomenon that repeats itself often throughout the African continent. And so he's really dealing with a very significant structural problem in the history of African politics in the aftermath of decolonization. And so when, although one may enjoy very much reading, uh, you know, like say, uh, the more theoretical analyses like those in uh, in uh, Wretched of the Earth by, uh, by Franz Fanon, which are very prescient, clear-sighted uh, analyses of the post-colonial, uh, neo-colonial situation. Zongo's novel has the advantage of presenting many of these same themes, but doing it in, in a way that is enjoyable and readable, despite the fact that there are aspects of, of the narrative that are indeed disturbing. But he's, we have to remember that uh, he is writing for the Burkina Bay people. And so he, he appeals very clearly to a particular kind of audience. And if we're reading this, let's say, in somewhere like the United States, we need to remember we're not the primary audience for this narrative, that this narrative is, is intended uh, for the Burkina Bay people, and it's intended to be a, de quite deliberately a didactic novel, which is to say a novel that carries with it a kind of a lesson. It's, there, there is a moral to this story, as, as we're going to see. Now, uh, Zongo lived from 1949 to 1998. He also wrote under the pen name Henri Zegbo for the newspaper that he founded, the L'Independent. Uh, he wrote many very fine uh, journalistic pieces there. And again, if you want to learn more about that, I have the other lecture on the motivization of Burkina Faso that focuses on his uh, journalism. His, his wife now, his widow, uh, continues to run this newspaper in Burkina Faso. As, and I said, as I said in the last lecture, it was when I lived in Burkina Faso in 96, 97, it was really the, the single most reliant, uh, paper that you could get to find out what was actually happening in the country because he fearlessly spoke the truth. Uh, now, um, 
the the Mobotization of Burkina Faso was published in ninety seven um, as a as a journalistic piece translated into English in two thousand and one. The parachute drop was written prior to many of these events that took place. Uh, although we're going to see that um, that it also uh, is is quite prophetic in in, in many ways, and it was uh, translated into English in two thousand and four. Now, Rubenga, uh, uh, the novel, the other novel that Zonga wrote, which has not yet been translated into English, deals with similar themes of corruption. But in this case, the setting is in the pre-colonial era, and uh, the, it's about a corrupt uh, African leader who is um, exploiting his people in, a, in, a, in the, the tribal sense, uh, much like uh, the novel. So it's, 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 it, the themes, they're very parallel themes. It's just that one is the pre-colonial setting, one is a post-colonial setting. Now, as I said in the last lecture, Zongo was assassinated outside of Ouagadougou in his uh, car on December, his Land Rover on December the 13th, 1998. Uh, he was with his younger brother, Yimbe Ernest Zongo, Blaise Ilbadou, and Abdoulaye Ablase Nakima, uh, and they were all killed together by members of the RSP or the Presidential Guard of Blaise Compore, probably under the direction of Francois Compore, who uh, was uh, Zongo was doing an investigative journalistic piece on for having tortured his chauffeur, a man named David Wadrego, and then and then killing him. And he didn't he didn't want he didn't want to be he didn't like it when uh, Zongo was uh, poking around into the, the obvious fact that he had committed murder. But we have to remember that at this time, there was a lot of impunity in Burkina Faso, and, and Zongo wrote about a lot of different kinds of murders and, and uh, tortures that were taking place, not just the murder and torture of David Wadrego. And he, he wrote about the corruption of Blaise Kampour, and as I said in the last lecture, the killing of, uh, of uh, well, the, the, the investigative piece onto David Wadrego, in my view, was more of the straw that broke the camel's back because he had written a succession of pieces criticizing Kampori. So he, he paid for his he paid for his life for the things that he wrote and he knew that he was threatened. He knew that he was imperiled. Uh, when I heard him speak at the embassy in Ouagadougou in uh, the spring of 97, um, I heard him describe how uh, Kampori's henchmen had tried to kill him on a number of occasions and how he constantly was having to evade them. But in the end, they, they did uh, uh, succeed in, in murdering him. This is a quote from the, the parachute drop, and I think it shows us something of, of how, you know, how clear seeing Zongo was. It's, 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 but it's eerie because it's almost as if he's predicting his own death. He says, Your Excellency, we have drawn up a plan of action. This is uh, one of the... Um, one of the advisors who is speaking to him at the palace when when this when rumors of a coup are being circulated, he says, but but with your permission, I'd like to let Monsieur Marcel speak up for us. Uh, and then and then the president, President Gua, this this demon, this man with this kind of demonic malice and energy, who is this dictator despot that is the main character of this novel, says, You've drawn up a plan of action. Why not do what we've always done? Fire bomb them in their cars over the weekend. If that doesn't do the trick, we'll finish the job once we've got them to the hospital. Now you can see here pictures from the actual firebombing of Zongo's vehicle, and in, in which he was, it was, they were littered with, uh, they were, they were machine gun fire sprayed all over them, and then the killers from the RSP came in and dropped firebombs in the car, and all of the, their bodies uh, were were burned beyond recognition with the exception of one man whose body was found outside of the vehicle. I'm not sure which of the of the companions of Zongo that was, but Zongo's body was completely uh, incinerated. This this drew the outrage of, of the Burkina Bay people and led to a, a period of extreme intense uh, unrest in Burkina Faso, but he was never, uh, uh, the killers of Zongo were never brought to justice and that remains the situation today, even after Blaise Campore had fled Cote d'Ivoire with the help of the French being shepherded out of the country. And now he lives in exile in Cote d'Ivoire. So you can see here the French uh, version of this novel, um, Le Parachutage, published in 1988. And then there is, so it's available in French. And, uh, and then there is in 2004, 
There is the, uh, the English translation, which is available from Africa World Press. Now, before we uh, look at this novel, I just want to make a few points about the novel. In the, in the previous lecture, we were talking about journalism, and now we're talking about the novel. And, um, and so I mentioned this term. I said the novel is didactic. And it's also, in some sense, allegorical. And now, what the, the allegory? What allegory is, is is an extended form of parable, and uh, and a parable, like a biblical parable, is a story that has that tells a kind of a lesson. It's a story that has a point to it. Now, Chinua Achebe, in his book of As, he's the author of Things Fall Apart, which is one of the best-selling books of all times. And, uh, and remains a riveting, fascinating read. If you haven't read it, then I say shame on you. You should read it. But he also wrote a, a book of essays called Hopes and Impediments, which gives, which outlays his views on aesthetics and the writing of, of the novel, writing of fiction. And he, he says something very interesting here, which I'd like to bring to our attention. He says, you know, he, he's very compelled by the views of, say, the Franco-Czech writer Milan Kundera, who, who insists that a novel should not have a thesis or novel. This is what Kundera calls a lyrical novel. For Kundera, novels should not seek to be didactic or conversionary. They should be you know, uh, inquiries into human existence, or they should be questioning works of, of literature which, which raise questions, but don't seek to persuade. And for Kundera, the function of the novel is to explore a hitherto unknown aspect of human existence. Now, Chebe reads this, and he's, as a writer, of course, he's very compelled by this because he wants his novels to be uh, as well written as possible and to be as artistically sound as possible. But he says, you know, I'm, I, I also have a responsibility, a teacherly responsibility, a responsibility to teach my people because I'm, I don't have the luxury that someone like Milan Kundera has, um, I live in, in a world where, uh, where, where people really need uh, to, to be instructed. And so he, he, can't, you know, he can't go fully with, um, with Kundera in this regard. And he says, so he says, my, my novels do carry a kind of a lesson. And, and historically, the, uh, the, the literature of Africa has tended to be more allegorical. And this is one of the things that's often off-putting to readers in the West who are very much influenced, like in Europe and the United States, who are very influenced by this Kantian idea that art should be for art's sake itself, art for art's sake, or l'art pour l'art. It should not, uh, it should not be political. It should not be sermonizing. But this is not something that is uh, as compelling in the African context. And so, when when you come to a novel like *The Parachute Drop*, uh, one of the things that may surprise you is how frankly political and didactic it really is. And it's all it, it's didactic as in it seeks to teach us a lesson. It's overtly, non-apologetically political. And at the same time, it's allegorical. And so when I say allegory, and we can think of Guama, we can't just simply think of Guama, this, this, the president of this fictional country of Watanbo, as being uh, a, a straight-up image of Blaise Kampore, um, nor even the president of Togo or Mombotu. It is quite deliberately, he is a composite uh, because, because Zongo is not just talking about a problem that is a Burkina Bay problem. He's talking about a problem that is an African problem and is a very well-known problem. And he's proposing very particular solutions to it. And so it's quite interesting in the sense that it gives us a, a, an insight into the psychology of some of these uh, corrupt dictators. And... Uh, and I, I, uh, I, I, you know, I urge you to, as, as you're reading it, to when you know, to, to kind of, if you're not used to reading this kind of literature, to be patient with it, because it's you're, you're, you you got to remember again, it's this is this is a novel that is written for uh, in the first instance for African peoples themselves, and 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 we who are not uh, Africans who are reading this from outside of the continent. Are, are, are a secondary audience at best for this text. Now, um, this, this man on the, well, there's Blaise Kampore. You know, he's, again, the one who murdered Thomas Sankara and, uh, and Norbert Zongo and many, many others. He was president of Burkina Faso from 1987 to 2014 for about 24 years. You know, he, 
He removed the Artic Article 37 of the Burkina Bay Constitution that had term limits for presidents. So, because he didn't really want to be a president, he wanted to be a king. He wanted to rule for life. Now, the longest uh, running president in African history, even longer than Mombotu, was Asimbe uh, Iadema, the president of Togo from 1967 to 2005. He was president for 35 years. He was a particularly repulsive figure. And uh, this, this was the context within which Zongo wrote the novel. Some people see in it uh, more a portrait of uh, Iadema than, rather than uh, Kompore. But again, it's not Iadema, it's not Mombotu, it's not Kompore. It, it is a, Guama is, is an allegorical kind of figure, a figure that is representative of all of these African despots and this, this structural problem in African politics that Zongo is addressing. But, but uh, Iadema was, uh, he was, he was quite a grotesque figure. He also was quite involved with sorcery and uh, many of his advisors were sorcerers. And this is one aspect of the parachute drop. When, when readers read the novel, they think surely these descriptions are, are exaggerations, but uh, uh, regrettably they're not. Uh, uh, Yadema was, was very much influenced by marabous and sorcerers as his advisors. And uh, so Zongo is commenting on an aspect of his um, reign as, uh, as, as the head of Togo. Of course, he's, he died and, and his son, they turned over the power to his son, who was welcomed in the White House by uh, uh, Barack Obama, by the way. And his son carried, us, carried on the same repressive policies as his father. So it's, uh, but he was, he, uh, Yadema was, was a very repulsive kind of figure. And so Guama is also a repulsive figure. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see that when we look at some of the descriptions from the narrative. You can see here on the map, Burkina Faso was above Togo. Now Togo was originally a German colony that the Germans lost in their, uh, after they lost World War I. And so it was, and then it became uh, under a French control. But uh, so, so Zongo, when he was beaten uh, for having and imprisoned for having written the parachute drop, it was in Togo that this this took place. Um, so here are some of the main themes of the parachute drop. Um, and so there's, it's a very rich novel in terms of the themes, and there are many there are many many things one could say about the novel. Uh, we'll 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 look deal with some of the themes. Uh, we won't be able to deal with all of them, but we'll try to identify some of the main themes. And so some of these are the psychology of the African dictator, as I've already said. Uh, like what motivates these these grotesque figures to do the things that they do? These power hungry, greedy figures like Blaise Compaoré. And what is the role of the military in uh, in governance in uh, in Africa? The the poverty of Africa's political discourse. The, the, there's, a, there's a sense in which uh, Zongo you know, parodies the, the very grotesque kind of uh, political discourse about the founding father and, the, and their guiding light and so on, these, these very inflated kinds of uh, claims that are made to, uh, that, that don't really fool anybody, but, but are uh, part and parcel of, of this legacy of dictatorship in Africa. And then there's the theme of the debasement of Africa's women. Um, in a previous lecture on Thomas Sankara, I said that um, you know, Sankara put the, the emancipation of women at the center of his politics before Blaise Compori had him assassinated. Um, Zongo is also uh, is, 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 you know, very, uh, he, he, he depicts images of women being you know, debased by these figures and it's 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 very uh, it's scandalous, and it's it's pathetic, but it's also a, a reality. And so he's you know he's he's drawing attention to an, to what goes with this kind of attitude of, of dictatorship and how it affects women, uh, political corruption, and then you know then the moral rectitude of government officials. So corruption is is obviously a theme of the parachute drop, but. Also, the theme, which is a theme of, of Zongo's journalism, and, and again, remember, this is a didactic novel that's meant to, to teach us a lesson, teach the readers a lesson. And one of the things that Zongo will repeatedly come back to is this idea that 
uh, if you're going to if you're going to serve the people, if you're going to be an elected government official, president, for instance, or even a low, you know, or, or some other hold some other office, you need to be uh, you need to have you need to be uh, sort of have your house in order. You need to be ethically. Uh, you know, um, an, an ethically upright person. This was also, again, uh, Sankara, his notion of the Burkina Bay as the land of the upright people, the virtuous people. Uh, Zongo and Sankara both cried out for virtuous leadership, morally, uh, 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 moral leadership. The African comprador class. Uh, this is, uh, again, this fatalist theme uh, of this class of people who were created by the French, by the colonizers, to uh, to rule uh, Africa on behalf of the French, or in the case of the British colonies, the British, uh, the Portuguese, and so on. A neo-imperialism in Africa, the IMF, or the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, this theme of neo-imperialism is, is an important theme of Zongo as it was for Thomas Sankara. And then the sufferings of the wretched of the earth, or the subaltern, the poor, the poor of the poor. Uh, this is, is, is an important uh, theme for Zongo, and how it is precisely what, who, what Fanon, those people that Fanon called the wretched of the earth, who pay the highest price for these corrupt policies. Then the crimes of France in Africa, the hidden crimes that, are, that often get swept under the rug or not talked about. Uh, but France has a long legacy of criminal behavior in Burkina Faso and in West Africa in general. And then the demonization of Marxism and socialism, how political leaders like Gouma in the novel will use uh, this, this kind of label of communist, Marxist, socialist as a kind of a straw man, to, in a dem uh, as a kind of a demagogue to stir up people's fear of, of what is essentially a straw man, because as, as we're going to learn that you know the problem is is not you know students who wants to claim that he's a or she's a socialist or a Marxist, but just the sheer overwhelming fact of poverty and and the context of, of this narrative, the context of uh, Zongo being a Burkina Bay writer, is that he lives in a world it's one of the poorest countries in the world, and so he faces incredible poverty. And then finally, the lethal elixir of sorcery in politics, and th this is the theme that uh, may strike many readers in the West as, as a little bit bizarre, but it's, it's a reality. And, and so he's dealing with this as well. He's, he's, he, he makes fun of Guama in some cases for his naivete and his involvement in sorcery, but he's not, Zongo is not making fun of animism um, and, and he's not wanting to demonize even necessarily sorcery or animism because part of these practices form the traditional uh, you know, are, are in the backdrop of traditional Sahelian culture. It's long been an animist society. Uh, and even, even people who are Muslims practice what many might re regard outside the region as a form of sorcery. But it's, it's, the question really is rather, does sorcery belong in politics? And certainly Zongo is going to uh, emphasize that it does not. It, it is not it's the, the, the sphere of the political is not an appropriate sphere for uh, for sorcery. And we'll look at some of those passages. So now here's the preface. This is the Zongo describes how he was beaten and imprisoned for writing this novel. He says, uh, who asked you to write about the president? Before I could reply, a blow struck me across the face. Another more violent assault followed. Then another flurry of blows. I covered my face in my hands. It was noon not morning, not evening, March 27th, 1981. It was like the beginning of time for me, the day my life began to melt like butter on a hot skillet. So you can see he'd already written the novel by night, even though it was published in 1988, uh, he'd already written the novel by 1981 and it, it, had, it had been intercepted when he had sent it uh, to, I believe it was Yuande in Cameroon to a publisher and so he's in Togo, uh, Iadema uh, is, is the president, and uh, he sees very clearly who, who is being depicted here. He, he, he sees, I guess, he's, at least he, he sees enough of himself in here that he's very disturbed by what he sees. And so Zongo is, uh, is beaten and tortured for having written this novel, uh, but he does, uh, he does survive. Here he says, Zongo says, the lesson that he learned from this 
uh, experience, he says, it was, in fact, it was then that I learned the truth about a certain kind of power in Africa, as well as the suicidal nature of all opposition, of all protest in our land. Most importantly, from that day forward, I understood that it was my duty to fight this power, to struggle for a more humane Africa, an Africa rid of detention sitters, death cells, and torture chambers, an Africa rid of founding presidents, clairvoyant guides, and single-party states. For I will never cease to believe that a day will come when African people will be able to march freely through their streets, holding protest signs aloft. So, uh, you know, it's interesting that he... Um, he, he says it's, it's suicidal to oppose, and yet he says it's my duty to, to do this. And so um, he was, uh, he, he met, this was a very deeply personal decision that he made at a very young age. And so much of this fearless journalism that he wrote was written after he had already been, you know, been tortured for his writing. Now, I would also note here, when he singles out this idea of the single party states. Uh, Blaise Compore was, you know, the, the, the Congress for Democracy and Progress with the CDP in Burkina Faso was a, was a single party that ruled Burkina Faso for many years. You can see Blaise there on his throne. Uh, and uh, it, it, it made it, they call it's called a Congress for Democracy, but in effect it's, it makes a mockery of democracy since there really is no choice at all for the people of uh of burkina faso when i when i used to live in jordan i heard a joke there about uh about saddam hussein who was said uh who also was a single party uh president and would receive in these mock elections he'd receive 99 98 percent of the vote and what and this, the way this joke went is someone that came to uh saddam hussein and said You've won 98, 99% of the vote. More, what more could you want? And he says, I want the names and addresses of that 1% and 2% that didn't vote for me. Well, that, that's the same kind of mentality that uh, Kampore had. And so even though this was a, was a political party, it was a one-party state, and it remained that way for, for, for a very long time. What it did, another party did develop in the aftermath of the brutal murder of Sankara uh, there, there was another party that formed, but it wasn't until 2014. You think if he, Zongo was murdered in 1998, and that wasn't so. It wasn't until 16 years later that Kampore was finally uh, forced from office and uh, driven into exile. Zongo writes: In that day, strikes will be held not merely to protest the reign of cancerous and mediocre regimes, nor to simply react against tyrannies that masquerade as democracies. Instead, protest will come from those who wield a wholly different kind of power, a power that they themselves create and make legitimate. Only then will underdevelopment vanish from our continent. So he, he ties underdevelopment to the, the question of this despot, because remember the despot is installed by external powers like the French, like the United States. And as we saw in our last lecture on the Mumbotuization, it was in fact David Dwight Eisenhower, the President of the United States, that ordered the execution of Patrice Lumumba in, uh, in, in, in Zaire, what was Congo, what became Zaire, and then, uh, and then supported, U.S. presidents supported for many, many decades this corrupt leader, Mumbotu, welcoming him into the White House. And so uh, this, is, this is a very significant problem. And Zongo is saying, you know, let me read it again. Only then will underdevelopment vanish from our continent, not until this problem is solved. And so he places this problem of the uh, African dictator at, at the center of his uh, journalism and at the center of, his, uh, of this novel. So now the French are, it's... it's uh, it's worth noting that in, in 2013, 2014, um, after uh, the northern after northern Mali was invaded, after the disastrous uh, NATO U.S.-led NATO strikes in Libya that destabilized the entire region, that the French were welcomed once again in, into Mali in this case to stabilize the north. And here you can see a man. Uh, who's got the, who's painted on himself, he's, in, in, he's painted himself into a French flag, and it says, welcome the savior, Francois Holland, who is the, 
president of, of, of France. And so France loves to play this role of, of savior, uh, bringing stability uh, without taking into account that their, their, their complicity, uh, complicity and being in participating in these NATO strikes in Libya is what first destabilized the region in the first place. And so, uh, so, so the, the era of French imperialism in, in West Africa is by no means over. Uh, not at all. And there, there are some, I've even heard it argued often in West Africa that what's going on right now in Burkina Faso with, uh, with these uh, so-called jihadist strikes and these terrorist attacks in Ouagadougou, as t well, for instance, took place in, I think it was in 2016, um, 2017 most recently, um, that uh, the, the, the French, after Kampoi was run out of Burkina Faso, they, they, they wanted him back and there was, there was a thwarted coup. But this, this idea that you know, if, if a country is destabilized, it applies a need for security and uh, therefore a need for, for the French to be back in, in, with a strong military presence, and, and able, which enabled them to, to rule for even longer. And so, so the imperial, those who think that we are living in a post-colonial, post imperial era in West Africa are, are sadly mistaken. Imperialism is ongoing and, uh, and this problem is, is uh, quite uh, sad. But uh, so the, 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 even though you know, Zongo is writing in the context of the Cold War, it's by no means, uh, this is by no, by no means a thing of the past that he is describing. Here's, uh, here is uh, the beginning section of the novel. Now the character Marcel he, he's a lot like, uh, if I can go forward for just a minute, if you've seen the, the film uh, Hala by uh, Simbane Usmane, wonderful film, very similar dynamic is illustrated there. And there you see the French advisor. You could think of him as being very like Marcel, who's talking to uh, the president uh, in this case. And so here you have, you know, but, but he's essentially bribing people and, and calling the shots behind the scenes. So you have a kind of a shadow government, you have puppet leaders installed, the, the, the government being run from the, from the French embassy. And so Zongo illustrates the same dynamic as, uh, as more money is brought to Guama and he takes his money and deposits it in his bank accounts in Switzerland. So it's essentially a bribe uh, and you get the phenomenon again that Fanon called black skin, white masks or black people in charge, but, but, but carrying on the same policies that existed during the imperial era. And this is what Zongo is drawing our attention to, as does Simbain Usmani and Hala. So let's read this paragraph. He says, Mr. President, Marcel said, all of this is happening, this, this coup de tat that is, that is in the making, because you refused to listen to me in the beginning. From the very start, I urged you not to expel our army. You refused out of pride. All right, so uh, the, the, the French have never wanted their armies expelled. They would love to continue occupying this area as they're occupying northern Mali right now. And, uh, but uh, he, he said, you know, he's saying it's your fault because you expelled our, let, let us provide the security for you. And what is the, uh, was it Carl Schmidt, the philosopher that says the cogito ergo sum of the state is security, um, you know, that, 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 that implies uh, obligation. If somebody brings you security, then you're obliged to them. And this is precisely what Marcel is, is wanting to, uh, was wishing would have happened is that, um, that let, we'll, we'll give you the security. But then of course, with that comes the price tag. You're, you're obliged to us. We're the ones that call the shots. And, and, uh, but Guma wanted the, the French army out and, uh, he, he, come, he, uh, built his own army, which then leads this coup against him. I says, you wanted to be surrounded by your cousins, your nephews and other relations, nepotism, big problem in the Kampori regime as well. You have refused to confront these problems. You wanted an army that could promenade in front of you, that could pay you homage. Well, you got what you wanted. You have nothing to complain about. I am no racist. Uh, that, those are always famous uh, words before racist utterance is uttered. I am no racist, but I recognize the difference between the races. Excuse me for saying it, but the black man is ungrateful. It's not me alone who says this. Even your own proverbs say the same thing. The black man lacks foresight, good sense. But of course, he he's the one who has this foresight and this good sense. If only the president will listen to him. And then when, when Marcel gives him you know another briefcase full of money, 
that makes him more inclined to be a good listener. Um, okay, now later um, when Guama is uh, when Gu Guama he is uh, there's a, the coup d'état the coup d'état takes place. He is uh, on the run and he's traveling with these students who are uh, disguised as as peasants. They know who he is, but they don't tell him. And um, and he they but but at a certain point they reveal their true identities to them. And they, they give him a little lesson to think about. And here is here we're going to see some of the more didactic aspects of the novel that enter into play when Zongo is, is we can think of the student as speaking what are, you know, through the, he, the student in this, in this case becomes a kind of a mouthpiece for Zongo himself because you'll find many of these same ideas echoed in the journalism of Norbert Zongo. Uh, so Guama, in this case, turns on the little transistor radio that was given to him by the Minister of the Interior of Zakro. This is a fictional country that borders the fictional country of Watanbo. And the radio broadcaster spoke of a horrible massacre perpetuated by a group of terrorists. He remembered a day when he was tilling the soil of Sanu's field with the others. This is Guama now thinking back when he had spoken to these young students. He had wanted to debate the question of terrorism with, with, the, with the student Mamadou and his friends. However, Mamadou had quickly cut him off. And this is Mamadou speaking. And here I think we see the, the, the ideas of Zongo coming through. The kind of terrorism you speak of does not interest us. It is the logical consequence of a society in which the political and economic bases are off kilter, in which the government in power systematically deceives its people. Okay, so terrorism. Now, this is very interesting in light of the fact that this is an ongoing problem in Burkina Faso right now, this kind of terrorism. It remains to be seen you know, at what point uh, the French will use this as a pretext to send in their military. Uh, and some have even suggested that, that the French are, uh, are encouraging these, these acts um, of, of terrorism. The, the, uh, the anthropologist Jeremy Keenan has a very interesting book entitled uh, The Dying Sahara where he makes a similar kind of argument with respect to what's going on in Mali and uh, that how he makes the case that terrorism is manufactured by the Algerians and, and the Americans in order to deliberately destabilize the reason, region. Now I, whether or not that's the case um, you'll have to decide, but I, I wanted you to be aware of that that view. So there is a sense in which many uh, people living in the region feel that the terrorism that is there, even now as we speak, is a terrorism that's, that most definitely serves the interest of the West because it continues to divide and conquer the people of this region, which then per, uh, creates the conditions for military uh, intervention and for further neo-imperial uh, development. But here's Mamadou, he says, uh, the terrorism that enters us comes from London, Paris, Washington. It is the terrorism of those who determine the value of our labor, of those who have never seen a coffee plant and yet fix the price of coffee on the market. That is a form of terrorism worth thinking about. Those who get rich on our misery are the real terrorists, not those poor wretches you mentioned, you mentioned earlier, the terrorists who harm us live on Wall Street in the business districts of Paris and London. Our enemy is the IMF. Our Islamic Jihad is against the World Bank. Quite interesting. Now, Zongo was by no means an Islamist. He wasn't even a Muslim, but he's using this term Islamic Jihad metaphorically speaking. He says, our, our fight is against this kind of uh, uh, imperialism, this neo-imperialism. Now, the IMF is, is the International Monetary Fund. And then the World Bank, these are the two pillars of uh, economic uh, development in, in the so-called third world. Um, I've, I've provided a definition here of the World Bank. Uh, so let's take a moment, look at this for those of you that are not familiar with what the World Bank is. It is an international organization affiliated with the United Nations or the UN and designed to finance projects that enhance the economic development of member states. Headquartered in Washington, D.C., it is the largest source of financial assistance to developing countries. It also provides technical assistance and policy advice and supervises on behalf of international creditors 
the implementation of free market reforms. You know, particularly in light now of the collapse of, of the uh, Soviet Union or the so-called Second World Socialist forms of government uh, when, uh, that were more centralized. Together with the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Trade Organization, WTO, it, it plays a central role in overseeing economic policy and reforming public institutions in developing countries and defining the global uh, macroeconomic agenda. Now here in Seattle, close to where I live in Bellingham, Washington, uh, the WTO was, there was a, a number of years ago, not long after the death of Zongo, there was an enormous protest in uh, in Seattle against the WTO that was being held in Seattle, meeting of those who belonged to it, and uh, uh, it, it was a legendary event. And uh, it, it, I think it took the World Trade Organization, those who belonged to it, quite by surprise. And now they're they're much more careful about uh, where they hold their meetings and who knows about them. But um, the, the, the International Monetary Fund and, and the World Bank, even those who founded these organizations have a difficult time explaining what the real difference is between them. But they, they work together to, uh, to the, the goal is said to be to uh, assist impoverished nations. But such assistance, like any, it's not, these, they're not giving handouts. There are no gifts. All of these so-called gifts that they give come with very uh, steep prices. This again was what Thomas Sankara did not. He, this was a price he did not want to pay. He did not want to to accept the gifts of the IMF, of the World Bank. He wanted Burkina Faso to be completely independent and self sufficient. This was this was something that Blaise Compaore immediately reversed this policy after he had Sankara killed. But uh, this young man is saying to Guma that it's the IMF and it's the World Bank. These are the people that are caught that are the that are causing our problems. And we could add to that the World Trade Organization. Now this is also this is another term that you should be familiar with if you haven't heard it before is structural adjustment. And here's a definition of structural adjustment. Structural adjustment programs consist of loans provided by the International Monetary Fund or the IMF and the World Bank to countries that experienced economic crises. The two Bretton Woods institutions are called this because they were founded in this town, this area, I think it's in Connecticut, uh, require borrowing countries to implement certain policies in order to obtain new loans. Again, every loan comes with the price tag. So you get a loan, you're indebted, you, you got to pay interest, you never get out of debt, it's just like a student loan, you take it out, the, loan, the interest is not forgivable. Remember, uh, Sankara argued that... Uh, that, that African nations should simply refuse to, to repay these, these poisonous debts. And he argued that uh, what was more appropriate was reparation rather, rather than debt. But so, so this is a sense in which how a debt, these are gifts or, or loans with very, uh, um, uh, very significant strings attached to them. And this is the problem with these so-called loans. They're not really loans. They're ways of ensnaring these countries uh, and, and imprisoning them and prolonging their, uh, their, their dependence upon the West. Um, and uh, so you, you get, so the, basically, we'll loan you the money, but this is what you got to do. We want this structural adjustment. And, you, you know, it could be who gets to take what class at the university. It could be this or that development project has to be built. But you're no longer calling the shots in your own country. It is the, these organizations that are calling them for you. Now, another theme in Zongo's novel is the role of Catholicism as, as, a neo, as an agent of neo-imperialism in West Africa. It's not, he, he doesn't really develop it that strongly, but there, there is an important character I'll, I'll, I'll mention to you. But first, um, you know, there's, the, there's a cathedral in Burkina Faso. I want to show you the image in the center is the center of the crucifix. And, and, and you might take note of how Jesus is quite the white deity there. Um, and, but so you have this, uh, this, this, this history of colonization and uh, missionary activity uh, marching hand in hand. I think it was Bishop Desmond Tutu who said something to the effect of, uh, you know, when, when, when the Christians came, you know, um, you know, we had all the goods and they had the Bibles. Uh, and when they left, we had all the Bibles and they had all the goods. And that, that's basically how, how it worked. Um, so uh, Zongo, as was Sankara, 
was very critical of, of how the Christian religion, particularly the, the French Catholic interpretation of it, played a role in fostering uh, colonial efforts in the region. And so he has a character named Father Paul, and he's not a hugely significant character. He could have probably been developed more, but he appears at the, he's a bookend in effect, because he appears at the very beginning of the novel and at the very end of the novel. And so um, he, here's a quote from the beginning of the novel. He says, in the churches and mosques, it was carefully explained that independence did not mean the coming of Satan as it would have had the Marxists gotten their way a few years ago. Father Paul, one of Guama's most trusted advisors, had stood in his black robes and preached in the capital's largest cathedral how God would surely reward the people of Watanbo for refusing these Marxist devils. And so we're going to see by the time we get to the end of the narrative that Father Paul, his most trusted advisor, is, uh, is, is also, along with Marcel, the, the advisor who's from the embassy, that both of them are... They've just decided that they're going to cut their losses with Guama and, and they're supporting the coup d'etat against him. And so he, uh, he, 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 Father Paul betrays Guama and, and Guama is naive enough to be shocked about this. Here's this scene at the very end, right before Guama is, uh, is executed. It says, Zongo writes, his ears buzzed and his sight blurred, but he could see well enough to notice a man walking towards him. It was a man he knew very well. How many millions of francs had he given this man? This man with his long black robe who walked with such slow, certain steps. Guama had just enough energy remaining to explode in one final crisis of anger. Get away from me, Satan. Leave me to die in peace, you devil. I will see you in hell, you and all those like you. I'll be waiting for you. I curse you. A thousand curses upon you. Your turn will come, you devil. You will pay just as I have. Paul, you are no priest, you are a devil. You, your bishop, your cardinal, and all the others like you, you who urged me to fight. And so, uh, yeah, just note this character. Again, it's, if you're not paying attention, you could, you could miss it, I think, because these are the only appearances of this character in the novel. But he does place them in this significant role of being at the very beginning and the very end, as again, I said, kind of, kind of bookends. Uh, to give you some kind of sense also of what Zongo thought of the church's role in the uh, imperial exploitation of his country, Burkina Faso. Now, another theme in the novel that's quite prominent, as I mentioned previously, is the role of politics and sorcery. On the far right, you see a book by Paul Stoller and Cheryl Oakes uh, entitled In Sorcery's Shadow. This is the single best source that I know to read, to learn about sorcery. Uh, Stoller was an American anthropologist who went to um, Niger and became a sort an apprentice of a sorcerer. He learned a great deal about uh, the beliefs of traditional sorcerers in the region. And you can see there in the middle um, a, a sorcerer on, on the street uh, corner. And then there's the, you can see the kinds of things that you might find when you go visit a sorcerer, the sort of goods that are, that are being sold, often animal parts. I've seen these, these kinds of sorcerer's markets quite often. So it's, it's a reality. It's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a fiction. Sorcery is, is a reality in West Africa, and it's linked to this very old interpretation, uh, religious worldview that long predates the, uh, the Islamic coming of Islam or Christianity. To the region. It's, it's a complex topic. We can't address it too much. Um, but again, I, I would just want to say in passing that it's not, you know, sorcery is not, in a West African sense, it's not necessarily a categorically evil practice. Uh, it, it depends on what's done with it. And, uh, but, but, I, but I think the point, so Zongo is not, you know, stigmatizing African religion or African animist traditions. He's rather uh, illustrating the dangers of what happens when, when sorcery enters into politics and, and in fact suggesting that sorcery has no place in politics. And I think that that's the point to uh, remember. Um, and here's, so we have this description of Guama arriving at the airport. This is, could be something, this could be a journalistic account of, of, uh, uh, Mumbotu arriving in Zaire. It says, nonetheless, at the crowded airport that day, a few critics could be heard mumbling skeptical remarks about Guama and the shiny leather bag he held to sell up his, celebrate his victory. 
The bag seemed too small to contain much of value, but maybe there was a chunk of gold inside or some magical talisman. Was it a symbol of independence? President, President Guam had never revealed what was in the bag that day, but it had to have been something special. One glance at the gendarmes and the presidential guard, zealously keeping all onlookers from getting too close, was all it took to see. And so he carries this little bag with him, this little, this little, uh, uh, this little magical object or fetish, as did uh, Mombotu, and Eadema was uh, also uh, pretty uh, involved in sorcery uh, as well. And here you can see, um, just have a little video here, of uh, Eadema, the president of Togo, who was probably the, the principal figure that Zongo had in mind when he wrote this. This was a, a uh, his, uh, this is reputed to be his god, his fetish that he worshipped, which is a, is a kind of a hideous figure, but it, it uh, of, of uh, made up of a kind of this coiled snake with its combination. It's a, it's a taxidermied object of some sort, but it's a very frightening lo looking figure. But uh, Iadema was what did traffic in, in sorcery. And this is, uh, uh, this is what, this is what he worshiped. And there he is, Iadema. You can see he's, he was quite a, quite a figure. Uh, uh, 35 years of terror and 35 years of brutality in which sorcery was, was used. His, his main advisors were sorcerers and uh, he, he did many of the things that are, that are described that seem so uh, hyperbolic and, and, and extreme in Zongo's novel, but he's just describing the acts of this man in effect. And there's uh, the smug Mombotu with his leopard skin cap and his cane that would also that has that it was a kind of a fetish that he carried around with him as well. Mamboto is also one of the figures who is being parodied in this novel. Now here's Guama speaking with his Tiga who is his, his sorcerer who is his advisor after Marcel leaves after having warned him about the coup d'etat. Left alone with his special advisor, President Guama reimagined the re-examined the situation. I will do what is necessary, Your Excellency, Tiga said. The marabou that I brought from Gao also recommended that we make certain sacrifices. He spoke of an impending crisis. I'm beginning to believe in everything he says. Still, the sacrifices he asked for are not easily made. I, you might note, too, Gao is by Kukuya, which is a site of, uh, of, of uh, sorcery activity in, uh, in, in northern Mali. Guma sat up in his seat. You're joking, Tiga. What did he say must be sacrificed, the moon or the sun? What sacrifice can be too steep to preserve my power? Then we get this really grotesque image of what he's, uh, and I, let's just read it. It's, it's, it's horrible, uh, but it's, it's, this kind of thing happens in sorcery practices. He asks your excellency that you cut open the belly of a black calf and insert the severed breasts and vagina of a pregnant woman. All of this must be done in the casket of a man buried in a cemetery. On the third day, we will extract three teeth from a skull buried just for you. You must swallow one of the teeth. The other two will be set into a magnificent cane that you must carry with you at all times. Think here of Mombotu. If anyone wants to steal your power, they will have to return the three teeth to their proper place, which will be practically impossible. And then uh, Guama says, well, Tiga, where is the difficulty? Even God would not condemn me for sacrificing two or three people to keep the country from falling to the Marxists. So this, this is a really uh, striking uh, moment in, in the narrative when you look at the, the grotesque uh, you know, combination of how sorcery enters into politics and how uh, you know, uh, Guama you know, believe, he believes this. This is not a, uh, this is something that he's, he's willing to, 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 to do. The hour is grave, Tiga said. And th now this, this takes place, this scene is, the, is the, this is a, more, a little bit more comical depiction of sorcery. Uh, you can and you can imagine Zongo laughing when he wrote this, uh, when right before the coup d'etat, uh, Tiga has, tells Guama that they have to go out into the country and he has to totally undress and wrestle a donkey. Uh, let's, let's read this. It says, the hour is grave. One of my sorcerers in the West just came to my house. He's very worried. 
He has foreseen a grave danger hanging over us. This is why he traveled more than 400 kilometers to warn us. He recommended that I make certain sacrifices, which I did without delay. But there is one more sacrifice that you must perform. You must wrestle against a black donkey, and you must defeat it before the break of dawn. Otherwise, the coming of the sun will mean the end of our regime. Well, you know, we see that uh, this is exactly what happens. The regime comes to an end. Guma goes out and wrestles with the donkey. He doesn't really defeat it either. Uh, but it's, it's a comical scene, and uh, it's, it's an amusing scene uh, uh, that you can imagine his Zongo's readers uh, relishing. Guma grabbed the donkey by the tail, clasping hold of it for dear life, struggling to bring the animal to the ground as the donkey jerked in a backwards motion. Guma at last let go of the tail and fell heavily on his rear end. The blood rose to his face. Pain shot up his back from the base of his spine. He bit his lip and angrily hurled himself upon the animal. For nearly ten minutes, the president was intertwined with the donkey, grasping at its front hoofs and then back hoofs, its haunches, its head and neck. He fought with rage but was unable to subdue the animal. The jackass remained master of the situation. The president's fat belly hindered him enormously. He sweated and panted like a track runner. He gasped for breath, resting for 10 or 15 minutes at a time before resuming the battle. Nonetheless, the jackass remained invincible. So, wow, here you have, he's out there totally nude, wrestling with a donkey and, and losing, uh, all to perform this, uh, this, this, this is how he believes he's going to uh, save himself from, from the coup d'etat. Now, I, again, I like to insert images from actual people in the region. These are some um, uh, pictures of Burkina Bag. I took this in about 1997 or so. Just ordinary, everyday people. But uh, it, again, when you're when you're thinking about these ideas in a conceptual way, or even reading it as a novel, it's it's important to remember we're talking about very real people and how these policies affect very real people, uh, wonderful people, and uh, and so uh, Zongo was. One of the other prominent themes of, of the narrative is not just what a grotesque fool uh, uh, this figure, Guama, is, but what the impact of his policies are upon the, the, the very real human beings of, uh, of, of the people that, that live in, in Africa. And so, again, I just ask us to, to bear that in mind as we're looking at Zongo's, uh, cast, uh, you know, criticizing the, uh, the, the way in which these policies affect the so-called wretched of the earth. Uh, here's Zongo. Another day began. Another day of incredible good luck for thousands of people for whom life has refused nothing. For Africa's wealthy and educated. For those who believe it is perfectly normal to exploit their brothers and sisters. To treat their fellows like beasts of burden. Another day for Africa's moral cripples. Another day began in a world of intolerable paradox, a world where the gods are summoned forth by demons, where spirit is measured strictly for its cash value, a world of incomprehensible duality in which good and evil go hand in hand, where heaven and hell exist in close proximity, a world where starving skeletons jostle alongside the grossly obese, a world of the Eucharist and the bitter pill. So, you know, he, um, this is very akin, this opening. You can see the Fanonist influence here as well. This idea, this the, the Manichaean allegory in Fanon, that the, that the colonial world is a world that's ontologically divided into. And, and some people live in islands of great prosperity and wealth and privilege, but the vast majority are excluded from these, these uh, islands of, of escape. And lead lives that are that are very uh, difficult. And this is particularly true in the case of the Sahel zone of Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, where these these lands are, are so uh, impoverished. The police had received strict orders to empty the town of beggars, lepers, the blind, the crazy. This is the scene where Guama uh, he has some some children. His children are bringing friends from Europe home to see Watanbo. So. 
they drive it, they don't, but they want to present a false image of the country. So they make sure that all of the uh, so-called wretched, the tattered, the homeless are, uh, are, are out of sight so, they, so that they won't be an embarrassment. Men and women and children were crammed together on big trucks that had been sent to evacuate them. Their cries and tears intermingled. Those who were unable to mount the back of the trucks, and there were many, were seized by the uniformed police who divided them into threes like so many sacks of peanuts. Some of the poor refused to be separated from their riches. A bundle of rags often concealed a crusty piece of bread, hidden from the vultures that plagued the village. For the beggars, the police relied upon the most persuasive of arguments, the billy club. The most wretched men and women wept and even prayed for mercy from a God who had already punished them for their unknown sins. This spectacle was not uncommon. It was not the first time the authorities had worked overtime to increase the misery of the people so that foreign strangers would only see the mayors, the governors, the president of a people so deprived of even basic necessities that the Boabab was their only shelter during the dry season. It was not simply from fear that the Western press might report the shocking details of the people's misery that Guama and his cabinet sought the removal. These poor people also truly irritated the government officials who hoped to make a good impression. The humility of the cynic. Now, in our, where we live here, for I live in Bellingham, Washington, we have a lot of homeless and, uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of irritation that, uh, that these government officials, that, that, that Zongo was describing, that these government officials feel at the presence of, of, these, uh, of these, these very poor people. It's, it's just, I think it's, a situ it's, a, it's, it's something that people in, uh, in, in the United States also can identify with, and people often you know, will feel irritated and disgusted at the, at the homeless and wish the streets were, were, were clean, of, cleansed of this you know, uh, of, of the trash that, that left by the homeless and of, don't want to be confronted with the presence of this. Uh, but they'll, they'll do that rather than simply fix the, the problems, adjust the gap between, uh, you know, those who have and, and have not. Uh, and so this is an index, obviously, of um, the injustice of any society, whether we're talking about this fictional nation of Watanbo or Washington State, where I live. The poor huddled together at each corner of the road in their misery and poverty, disguised old skeletons who sold millet cakes or peanuts. They were disguised as dirty young people with matted hair, vendors of cheap junk imported from China, milling about the streets without hope or purpose. But the case of an old woman, uh, Tim, uh, Timboko, Timpoka, excuse me, brought tears to the vegetable sellers, her breasts bathed in tears and mucus, her eyes wide with terror. She cried with outstretched arms, branches from a defoliated boabob tree, begging the police officers for mercy, calling them, my sons, my sons. The police destroyed the little shelter she had built to keep out the sun, her house. She's lived there even before I was born, said one of the market women in tears. And so these are these are obviously you know these are images that are that that uh, Zongo was deliberately trying to awaken our empathy so that we can sympathize with these people or empathize with these people who uh, are are suffering so much as a result of these uh, corrupt policies. So another theme uh, worth noting is the demonization of socialism. This is this is a theme in the novel. The way in which uh, socialism is. Uh, is, becomes a kind of a straw man for these uh, demagogues to, to attack when the real problem is really the problem of poverty, which goes unaddressed. So, but here's Guma. He says, he says, ah, oh, Marxism, it's the scourge of our times. These Marxist students with all their propaganda are like disease carrying rats. Our entire world bleeds from this Marxist ulcer. Whenever you find it, there's no peace and quiet. If you hadn't kept me from all traffic with the Marxists since independence, I would have been up to my neck with this child of Satan. He added, we'd be swimming in it. All men capable of telling gold from copper, as they say in my language, are capable of understanding that Marxism is the biggest catastrophe in human history. 
Now, uh, again, Zongo is not necessarily like Sankara, are advocating a Marxist solution, but he is advocating, uh, you know, an end to these kinds of distractions, these attacks uh, on on uh, these these sort of straw man type figures, uh, in order to evade addressing the problem, the true problem which exists, which is the problem of social injustice and poverty. Um, now, but this is Mamadou, the Marxist student who is a um, pre-med student who is speaking to Guama after he's revealed his true identity to him. He says, in Africa, everything comes from the outside. The workers protest against the inhuman treatment they suffer, but it's precisely foreign strangers who are most responsible for their exploitation. Again, IMF, World Bank, for instance. These students you despise merely dare to try and understand the sufferings of the people. They're not working for strangers. They're trying to figure out what strangers have done to us. Think about it. Do you really need a stranger to tell you that things are going badly? Do you have to read Lenin to grasp the fact that you don't have a job? Do you have to read Marx to understand that you're thirsty and hungry? Good, good questions. Is it necessary to study the Bolshevik or Chinese revolutions to understand that it is those societies where corruption, nepotism, and tribalism flourish that are rotten? that are the actual cause of violence, hatred, and crime among the people. Do you need to study such things in school to worry that your country may slide into complete anarchy, to worry about what may happen to the people you love should your country fall apart? So again, Zongo, like uh, Sank Sankara, was not an anarchist. He was wanting, uh, you know, he, was, he was arguing on behalf of law and order, but, but a, just, a just, a more just system, a legal system that um, in which there was freedom within the law, but one in which corruption, nepotism, you know, favoritism to family members, like we see here in the United States, Trump appointing his family, these posts and governments, very similar thing happens in Africa all the time. And then Trump also promotes a kind of a tribalism that is that also is uh, Guma promotes this kind of, again, uh, divide and conquer, set people against one another in order to, to, to get your agenda pushed through. And this, this is really for... Uh, Mamadou and Prisongo, I think, as well, the source of, of the problems that his people confront. Here's again uh, this character Mamadou speaking, but we can imagine the uh, Zongo speaking here. I can't imagine a more dangerous villain in our country than a corrupt leader. Even a murderer can only inflict limited damage before he is finally caught. But a tyrant who ruthlessly exploits his people inflicts immeasurable damage. I can't really imagine a more serious enemy of the people than a tribalist who disguises himself as a businessman. Sounds like Donald Trump to me. Uh, I'm sorry, Guama, but it seems to me that your so-called morality, your great wisdom, and political expertise amount to little more than a kind of varnish to gloss over the horrible crimes you have committed. The fact is, you don't fool anybody. It's been a long time since you fooled anybody. So uh, very strong words indeed. But again, I, I underscore, as, as did Sankara and Zongo in his journalism, that the, 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 one of the main solutions that he's holding out is that if you're a leader, if you want to lead your people, then you need to be ethically, uh, uh, you, need to, you need to have your ethical house in order. You, you, know, you need to not be corrupt. And so one should look for, it, it matters, uh, the, the character of our elected officials, it matters whether or not they are corrupt. It's not a small question. It is an enormous a question of enormous significance. And he tells, Mamadou tells Guam, he says, if it's true that you feel you've learned something, teach those like yourselves. Teach all those who label others Marxists and revolutionaries what harm such words do, how they needlessly divide African peoples and distract them from the real battles that confront us. The true battle in Africa is not between pseudo-moderates and pseudo-progressives, but between the exploiters and the exploited, the rapists and those who are raped. Teach all those you know. Now again, teach. Notice this word again. Teach, teach, teach. Um, it's it's. This is a didactic novel. He's got a. He's not. This is not art for art's sake. He's got. He, he, there's something he's trying to tell us. There's something he's trying to teach us. But primarily, he's also trying to. You know, teach his his own people, their his his uh, African readers. What example did you set for the people when you were in power? 
These evils that you denounced were the inevitable consequence of your own regime. And then Guillermo tries to defend himself. He says, with me as president, we had a liberal, open political system. And uh, Mamadou responds, just like the United States and Europe, only in the lawless domain of the economic, not in our political system. So you had a kind of a liberalism where you had a liberal market, but you had uh, the, there was no real uh, freedom or liberty in politics. There can be no real economic freedom without political freedom in equal measure. Out here in the bush, a man does what he says he's going to do. He he's, becomes a man of his word. It's the same for all of us. All of us have to be people of our word, people whose word can be trusted. We have to be responsible, and that's what being responsible means. It's, it's upholding your vows, keeping your, your words, keeping your promises. But if you presume to guide the destiny of others, you must be willing to sacrifice your own destiny, your own personal desires. If you present others from speaking freely about their deepest hopes and dreams for the future, you inevitably prolong their underdevelopment. And this is why a, a journalist like Zongo and a novelist like Zongo was killed, is in order precisely to prevent him from speaking freely about his deepest hopes and dreams so that uh, Burkina Faso's underdevelopment can be prolonged. But, Mamadou says, Africa our Africa will win in the end. The people will triumph. And one day, the people will humiliate you and all those like you, just as we have humiliated you today. History will march forward. Guruma and those like him, Blaise Compore, Mombotu, uh, Iadema, and many others, cannot stop the course of history. Adieu. Guruma stood utterly baffled. He could not believe his ears. He stammered out a few incoherent words of apology, but Mamadou and his friends had already left. So this, this, even though the narrative does seem very bleak, it's not, Zongo's message is not bleak. Zongo's message, it's not a message of, again, Afro-pessimism. It is a message of an Africa delivered from de these kinds of demonic despots like Guama, like Blaise Kampore, like Mumbotu, like Ufe Bonnier, like so many others, an Africa finally free of these puppet governments that, that the West, Europe, the United States, and so on installs. Here are Zongo's killers. Uh, Blaise Kampori, that he has such a nice face there on the left, such a nice smile. Sometimes he's called Handsome Blaze. He is a handsome man, but he's also, you're looking at the face of a killer. And that's, that's important. You know, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard when we look at people who seem to be so nice to to really grasp that uh, behind that nice smiling face can lurk a quite evil heart, the heart of a killer. And there's, there's his brother, Francois uh, Compore, uh, who uh, was uh, the chief figure who orchestrated the uh, assassination of Zongo, but also the torture and murder of his chauffeur, David Wadrego. People who act with just total impunity, uh, belief that they are completely uh, above the law. But... Uh, although justice has not come yet to Burkina Faso, justice has not yet uh, come uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, those who killed Zongo, those who killed Sankara, being punished for their crimes. Uh, at least we can say that Kampori was driven from power. Uh, the coup d'etat to bring him back failed. And let us hope that, it, that these kinds of power grabs always fail.